I know that we're not talking tax, but I do need to say this because most tax guys don't know this. Um, in real estate, you, you go from an... Well, welcome to our show today. We have Devin Hobb. A little background on Devin. Devin's been a real estate agent for about 10 years, 10 right? 10 years, yeah. Started uh, in the recession and has come on out and glided past that. And then you also do a little bit of investing yourself. Is that right? That is right, yes. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you got started in real estate and, and some of your perspectives as you started off and then what they've turned into over time. Yeah. So um, when I was like 12, I would play Rich Dad, Poor Dad on the computer because nobody wanted to play the actual board game with me. So I was always interested in the investing side of real estate and Dean Graziosi and all of his books and stuff. So I, I really enjoyed that. Um, didn't realize at that age that I'd become a realtor. Um, but when I did become a realtor in 2009, as far as perspective goes, that's probably shaped the way that I invest. Um, my very first deal was a for sale by owner I called into and they said, sure, come on over. And when I got there, their moving truck was loaded and they handed me the keys and they had dual citizenship and the American economy sucks, we're off to Canada. Deal with that. I didn't even have a smartphone for perspective. Like I don't, they weren't really that big yet and everything was fax. And so how am I gonna communicate with this guy who's gonna go become a logger in Canada with no cell phone service and I got to deal a short sell on this house. That was my very first deal. And uh, consequently for the next few years after pretty much everything was foreclosures and short sales. And so that definitely has influenced the way that I am probably more conservative with the investing because that's where I started out my adult life it was in that situation. Okay, good deal, good deal. And what is your current investment strategy and what have, if you don't mind going into it, what are some yeah. other properties that you've So done? I'm a little bit slow and steady. Um, I, 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 I'm a Dave Ramsey endorsed agent locally, and so I've got a little bit of that rubbed off on me. Um, he's a financial, very conservative financial advisor, you could say. And so I, long story short, I was broke, very broke in 2009. I was just 22 years old, just got started couldn't really even afford to get my real estate license. And um, so anyway, I was barely making some money and I, 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 I bought my very first house uh, for my wife and I when we got married and uh, it was $70,000. And it, yeah, <laughs> 70 grand in 2000, I think 10 is when we bought it. And uh, there, everybody else that walked through that home, it was a foreclosure and there was multiple people looking at it and they all were like, no way, can't buy this. The front door's in the back. There's no drywall on the ceilings. Electrical's exposed, and there's no carpet, just floor, like concrete. And so it was a pretty big wreck. Um, and I saw the potential, and I asked my wife, like, are you sure you want to do this? And she's like, yeah, let's do it. And so my down payment was 3.5% uh, on 70 grand, so whatever that is, like 2,800 bucks and my payment was $442. And I remember actually feeling nervous to buy that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I called my dad and I was like, I, you know, I was like, you think this is a good idea? Like, I'm just not sure about, you know, this payment. And he's like, laughed me off. Like, there's no, you're not gonna get a $442 payment in a house ever. And so we did it, fixed it up over two years, uh, rented it out for one year after that. So we owned it three years, lived in it two, and then we sold it tax-free. You know, tax-free because there's no capital gains, and so we sold it for 127, and um, and we had put like ten thousand dollars into it. So we we're into it for eighty grand, and we sold it for 127, and walked away with somewhere around like forty-eight thousand dollars. And it's no, no all capital gains, like no no capital gains, no income tax. It's just straight money. So I'm going to stop you. What is the rule on capital gains? Yeah, so capital gains, there. if you've lived in your home that is your primary residence, two out of a five-year period. So if you lived in it year one and two and then rented it out for three, two years and then sold it on year five, that's fine. You, you wouldn't have to pay your capital gains tax and income tax and all that. 
if you did have to pay capital gains tax, it would be roughly, it changes all the time, but I think right now it's somewhere around 17% and the rate goes up with the more money that you make with your regular day job. And so uh, capital gains, somewhere around there, but then when you factor in your federal tax and your state tax, on top of that, you're pretty much 40%. So if you're gonna make 50 grand out of your, you know, you have $50,000 profit on your house and you're gonna sell it and you, if you do owe capital gains, it's, you know, there goes $20,000. Um, if I did my, yeah, it's 20 grand. So uh, I, I, I've had a hard time keeping the home. So we've, my wife and I have done a similar situation now um, four times basically. So the homes that we live in, uh, I have a hard time converting them into rentals personally because it, the market has been going up. I wouldn't have a hard time if the market was flat. I'd just convert that into a rental and hold it because buying a home is not easy. Getting loans are not easy. So if you have one, you want to keep it. But if, if the market went up substantially to where you're going to make tax-free money more than you would if you'd held it as a rental in the passive income for 20 years, like sell it tax-free and go buy another one or actually go buy a real rental that you're willing to rent and do capital gains and stuff. So um, anyway, that's, that's been my strategy. So that's, that was the start of our strategy. It was, um, I've still never touched any money uh, from personal use from those real estate snowballs that we've done where we've lived in them enough to qualify to not have to pay tax when we resell. I've never touched that money. They're always rolled into either my personal residence or other rentals. Great. And talking about other rentals, I don't want to get too much into tax. We'll be, we'll be covering that next week. But with that, you can do a 1031 exchange and the money that you would have, right, the profit that was generated through that property, yeah. you can take and you can roll that into your other property and it's tax deferred. It's not tax free like it would be if you sold it to yeah. avoid your capital gains, but it's tax deferred. So you don't have to pay it until you sell the other one. Yeah. Um, which is also just a nice little nugget to know. Yeah, and I, I know that we're not talking tax, but I do need to say this because most tax guys don't know this. Um, in real estate, you, you go from investment property to investment property, you can roll upwards in value tax deferred. Well, one day you're not going to want to keep owning real estate. And so when you go to sell, most people are just going to pay the price then on all that tax that's been deferred. But if, if you're net, you know, if we're, if it's doable, you can, you can go and buy your final property, rent it out for, I think, either one year or two years in a day to qualify for that 1031 exchange. You defer all that tax, you rent that final property out that you've rolled the money into, and then once that time period, which I can't remember, one or two years is over where you've treated it as a rental property or investment property, you can then move into it as a primary residence for two years, sell it on year three and you've deferred all your real estate tax your whole life and then just qualified for the uh, capital gains tax uh, exemption. So that's the one way to get out of real estate capital gains tax that I've ever heard. Right. And I think all these things kind of roll into what I think is important. And I want to touch on this briefly and then we'll, we'll okay. roll into a little bit of the future of real estate, how we see that playing out and how yeah. that how that influences investing. Um, I, I think it's important to work with an expert who knows what's going on in the situation. And, and there's so many financial planners, right? A long story short, right? These insurance agents, they, they're at, at a point, they're calling, they're called death insurance at one point, right? Yeah. And then they call it life insurance. And now they're financial planners, right? right. So it's kind of the evolution of, of financial planning. And honestly, I think as agents, we need to do a lot more of that. First off, we can't just make up that, that garbage. I mean, you can't just make up whatever you want and tell yeah. people that. That's wrong, right? Right, right. That. But get informed on how it works yeah. and then guide people through the process. Talk about the importance of that and what value you see an agent brings during that part. Well, I think if you're working with an agent that understands real estate through and through, um, that, but also practices what they're preaching. Um, I think what you're asking is treating real estate more as an investment and also as a retirement plan and, a, you know, financial planning pretty much 
is retirement planning, in, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that'd be, unfortunately, it took me like six years in real estate to realize, crap, I should be doing this myself. Like, I mean, I always wanted to or knew, but I didn't realize how important it is to, to, re to, to really get your retirement figured out. And, and most people, I will, as I've researched this for myself, just the school of hard knocks, like, I always felt envious of those who've got their 401k going or they got an employer who's going to match and they've got all, everything's figured out. Well, I don't know what, how much people really make or how much they really got going in their 401ks, but my observation, the more I learn is that it's not enough. It is not enough and it's not on track to be enough to be able to pay your monthly living expenses when you want to retire. Um, pretty much that's a common thread. And so whether it's stock market, fancy 401k plans, IRAs, this, this, this and that, um, I'm learning more about that right now, but I just keep coming back to real estate makes sense. Like you pay this property off, who cares what the market does? The rent will always adjust with inflation. So when I'm 70 years old, my income will be directly proportionate to what inflation has done. So my, my living expenses will be met because the rent will go up or down. It'll do whatever, whatever it'll go up with what the economy is doing. And so it's like, it's just simple. It's something that I feel maybe because I'm passionate about it, but I just feel like with a little bit of effort, it can be understood. Most people don't realize 401k is a, it's a tax code. It's not a retirement plan. It's a tax line. It's like a line in the book. And so I just think most people just do what everybody else does and they don't know really what's going on with their retirement plan. That's kind of what it seems to me. And then the guys that I've met with financial planners to try to help me understand better the pros and the cons, where's the risk, what's the expectations, how, how often do these expectations of the, you know, get met? They don't have the answers to that. It's just a system. Do it and follow it. Don't ask questions. And on top of that, here's where inflation is a big one because I'm sure everyone, or, and if it, you haven't had that yet, it'll come. <laughs> You'll sit, sit down with a financial planner and they'll say, look, this is the value of compound interest, right? And they'll do their yeah. whole spiel on it, which is valuable. It's good to know. And it's good to see how those things play out. But then they're like, listen, if you do this in 30 years, you'll be able to have this amount of money, right? Yeah. Which it sounds like a lot today. Which is valuable, right? But then they're not incorporating inflation. And, and I mean, they are calculating that. But you, as they're giving you that number, you're not thinking inflation. Right. That's not what you're, what's, what's associated with it, right? And then they're like, hey, your, your returns are 20%, which is like unreal, right? So yeah. that's like on the high end. But that's 20% of the money that you put in. What I love about real estate is the fact that you can leverage. Yeah. And I think this will go into a little bit of the future and then we'll talk about differences sure. in and how I know you like to invest and how I how I like to invest and what I've seen the differences are yeah. there. But just talking about that on the on the very the basic principle of it is in real estate you can leverage through these whether it's life insurance, the stock market, or whatever you're doing, the S P five hundred, you're not you can't leverage. It's whatever money you put in is the only amount of money that you're grows. getting a return on, yeah. So the cool thing about real estate is I can buy a house, right, three percent, three and a half percent, five percent down, yeah, ten percent, fifteen, twenty percent, right? Just thinking of different programs. And even if I'm doing a traditional investment twenty percent down, I'm leveraging eighty percent of this property. And all that if that goes up four percent, then my twenty yeah. percent is going up. Well, and like a, a tangible scenario, like my, my very first house, I bought it for 70000 My cash-in was $2,800 for the down payment. I actually financed the repairs because the recession at the time, everybody's buying junky houses and there's loans available for that. So I financed the repairs. And so my cash-in was 2800 bucks. And when I sold, I walked away with like 48000 And that was a four and a half year period, I think it was. And so I made over 1,000% on my money. Had I put $2,800 in the stock market at that time, it would have turned into like four grand, maybe, maybe, like best case in four years. And uh, maybe five, I don't know. But 
yeah, so my 2800 turned into 48 in four years. You, you can't really get, you can't do that you know, because it's the leverage. But it's leverage secured by something tangible. It doesn't just disappear or go out of business or you wake up and the emotional high, like, yeah, okay, the recession, it fell. It, it, in Utah, at least, it only fell like 25% after going up like 60. So it's not too bad. Mm -hmm. It's not too bad. Where you get messed up, though, is over leverage. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. And then going back into it, that's just, we just talked about appreciation in your example, right? Yeah. We didn't even talk about debt payoff, right? Because no, all yeah. along the way, you're paying off this mortgage, and that's less that you owe at the end of the day, whether yeah. you sell it, whether you keep it, whether you're using it as, as another financial vehicle, doing a home equity line of credit on it, right? There's a million different things you can do, Yeah. but th we're not even talking about that. We're not talking about any of the tax benefits associated with it, although we right. touched on that briefly. So there's, there's multiple ways to make money in real estate, and it's not just appreciation, although in most cases, that's where the, of the bulk of the money comes well, from. Well, that's the tangible stuff to see in a short time. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, no, you're seeing mortgage paid off by renters. You get depreciation on the property for like 27 years. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways that over time you're making money. And it's probably, taking appreciation out, it's probably comparable to stock market returns, mortgage pay down, depreciation, interest deductions, all that stuff. If you're working elsewhere in a day job, you're saving money on your taxes because of your real estate investments. And so anyway, yeah, it, I, I would say it's probably a fair comparison when you take appreciation out of real estate. It's probably similar to a stock investment or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Right. But then also with appreciation comes the increase in rents as well. right? Yeah. And this is let, let's just jump right into it. What do you see the future of real estate? Let's go kind of wide on the nation nationwide basis. I know you're yeah. I know your perspective there and I'd like to share it. So nationwide and then let's go in a little bit more micro. We're we're here in Utah County. Um but I think Utah County will be similar to Davis County, it'll be similar to Salt Lake County, it'll be similar to Weber. We have From Ogden down to Santa Quinn. Pretty much this discussion applies. Yes. Uh -huh. So we'll go into that, but let's talk about nationwide what you see the future being, right? And no one has a magical ball. We're, we're, yeah. we're speculating on what our opinions are. And then, and I think this will transition to a little bit of what you see in Japan. And then we'll, we'll circle back around <laughs> to what I, what I think the differences are on what's, yeah. what's happened there and what can actually happen here. Yeah, well... There's a bigger, longer picture. There's trends that could change. Next year, trends could change. But if trends continue, the trends that I look at are um, birth rate. So you've got, uh, I've heard, you know, him and I have talked about different numbers. But I, I've heard 2.1, 2.2 roughly is what it takes to keep a nation. 2.1 babies per uh, woman roughly is what it takes to sustain population. It won't grow, it won't decrease. And um, I think America is at 1.9 collectively, roughly. I think we're at 2.3. We're, we're above it, mm -hmm. 2.3. Yeah, so we're still, currently, we're still mm -hmm. above it, but there's trends speculating yeah. that that's gonna go down. Well, I've heard, in, in, if we are above it, it's, it's, it's mostly- um, Immigration. A lot of immigration and different cultures that are more family oriented are still having cranking out babies. But um, regardless, with the, with the trends of even global, um, just less kids, less replacement, um, Russia loses a few, I mean, back in like 2008, they, they were losing more people than, they were having more abortions than live births in Russia. Wow. Yeah, crazy. Um, so anyway, that's a tangent, but if we're not necessarily growing in population, um, I always I always thought real estate goes up and up and up and up, and it, it just it always goes up. But Japan isn't that way, and I I just realized wow, it doesn't just because there's a house on land doesn't mean it's bulletproof. Um, Japan actually is depopulating so fast 
they have so many, uh, they have roughly, I think, around 30% vacancies. So without supply and demand still is the number one influencer of all economies um, and especially real estate. And so nationwide, you see trends of cities that have a lot of jobs are growing. Seattle is growing. The same, the same holds true in Japan as well, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So Tokyo, Tokyo is growing like crazy. But the outskirts and the little farming towns and whatever, they're depopulating. There's nobody there for them. The young people don't want to go live out there. And so the housing is not bulletproof there. So Tokyo is, is thriving. Um, and it, it's doing very well. They're building massive condominium towers uh, because the, the millennials don't want the big house. They want the condos. And so I think it's really interesting to, to see where Japan has, it has gone with their development it's it's not all doom and gloom or whatever it's just certain areas are no longer desirable because they don't have the jobs that the upcoming generations work in which is reflective of what the world really needs and so there's just shifting there's just a shift in what happens but they depopulate like no other um they're 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 depopulating pretty darn fast uh because they don't they don't have kids and so um, yeah. So with, with, if you have less people in a city, your, pri your housing prices are going to go down. If you got more people, you can go on Google and you just type in population growth in whatever city. And if the line's going down, probably not a good place to invest, uh, because the housing is not bulletproof unless you've got like job growth and maybe some immigration. But again, your population would grow if that was the case. So Utah in general, though, uh, let's get back on track. Utah is looking, it, it is, it's looking very, pr pretty strong. Um, job growth is insane here. Uh, Forbes and Wall Street Journal and everybody, you know, they, they constantly mention Utah is outpacing the rest of the nation in job growth, the tech industry, but not only the tech industry. The nice thing is if the tech industry has a bubble, which it probably will, um, our, our economy is very diverse. I think roughly only 30% of our new jobs are tech. And so the rest, it's, it's pretty diverse. We've got a lot of entrepreneurs. We have a lot of good medical companies, um, different sciences and, and uh, pharmaceuticals. Anyway, so it's a pretty diverse economy. I heard the, the governor uh, say that Utah is the number one state in the nation to take somebody out of poverty and bring them into middle class. So we've got great... We have great economics and because we have great economics people are flowing in and um and we have great demographics as far as babies born per woman like it's like around four Hoorah. yeah so <laughs> by babies alone utah doubles utah doubles by babies alone uh based off that stat and so housing should be in high demand for a long time and on top of it comparing our geographics like our geography to texas Texas is the number one state growing in population. Utah is growing at a faster rate, but we're small potatoes. We're only like 3 million people and San Antonio alone is like 3 million people. And so our rate of growth is very fast, but Texas has the number, they're the number one place as far as population growing. And so uh, they just add a ring around their city. You know, people move to Dallas, the city just gets a little bigger. And the pricing doesn't go up like, like Utah has been doing. It's going up at about half the rate as Utah. And, um, and, and so they could just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But in Utah, we've got the mountains, we've got the lake, and a skinny little strip of land that you can live in, both in Salt Lake and in Utah County. And, and so there's not much more room for housing. So that creates great demand. And then... Yeah, we're still going to grow, and there'll just be a valley over. It'll be across the other mountain range on the west. Eagle Mountain, Tooele, those areas still have a lot of growth to be had, but you'll be driving far. And just like people that live in San Francisco, you know, or work in San Francisco, they don't live in San Francisco. They have to commute two hours because the affordable living is two hours away. And so I don't, you know, I don't predict that Utah will be the same value as San Francisco, but since 1991... Utah has, the prices have appreciated at a faster rate than San Francisco, Seattle, and San Jose, California. And so 
we're doing pretty good. We're on a great trajectory, and because we have limited land and a high amount of people coming or being born, housing looks pretty solid. Definitely. So I, I want to go into it real quick. You've talked about a lot of things that are worthwhile. I want to talk about a couple of stats that I think are interesting. Um, and if you guys have any questions on these stats, I'll do a, another video that just goes over that because it'll talk about the what I foresee the future to be um, in real estate. We've learned our lesson, in my opinion, from 2007, 2008, from the big crash there. Yeah. Historically speaking, of the last six recessions, only two of them affected the housing market, and one of them only affected, this is nationwide speaking, and only one of them um, affected it more than 2%. I mean, the mm -hmm. other one it affected it 1.9%. So although yeah. there was a recession, it, the housing market was unfazed, it's essentially. Fine, yeah. The other one makes sense that the housing market was a part of it, the housing market. So 2008. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, that and, was the reason. Yeah, yeah that, that contributed to the whole thing. Um, so that, that being said, a lot of people are talking about, hey, there's a recession coming, there's a recession. And I, I do think so. I think yeah. in, in the next year, two, three, we'll see a recession, right? And all that, all that means is, right, that there, our GDP is going down and it's been negative for, I think it's three quarters or two quarters or something like that. Um, and I'll double check on the, on the video that we'll put out and I'll have the exact definition there. But bottom line is that doesn't, that doesn't housing crisis and recession are not the same thing. It's just supply and demand, yeah. And again, going back to it, another stat is currently about 30% of homeowners own their homes free and clear. This is nationwide. Yeah. And then 50% of them have more than 50% equity. Right. So what does that mean to me is we're learning our lesson and our homes aren't ATMs. Right. I mean, yes, you can use the equity and I recommend if you want to use it, use it for other investments. You can use it to start up your business. You can use it to help Make your kid get through you. college. I mean, whatever it is, like use it wisely. It's there and you can use it. Um, but overall, as a nation, we've learned our lesson. And what does that mean is when other people are doing it, then that does open up, in my opinion, that opens up opportunities for leverage. Yeah. Where you can go out and you can actually be a part of that. Utah County, again, another statistic, is scheduled to double its growth within 25 years. Right. So, again, what does that mean if Utah County doubles in growth, the houses stay close to the same, we can only grow so much. And we have cities that are fighting on high density homes. Right. So we have we have that occurring. Yeah, we don't have very much high density here. Yeah. And Payson is actually one that I think is planning it out very well. Vineyard's done a good job planning as well how they have everything structured as far as a good mix of high density homes with stacked condos and then areas that have townhomes and single family homes. So they're using the space very well out there. And it's worth knowing. It's worth knowing that that's what's what's going on. But what does that mean to me is, at least to me, that means appreciation is going to continue being a part of the game. Yeah. At least here in Utah County, for at least the next twenty five years. Yeah. I mean, I'm not very old. I'm I'm twenty three years old. That puts me at forty eight in twenty five years. So in my opinion, if all <laughs> supply and demand, right? Yeah. So if the supply stays the same or close to it then what does that mean is the demand is going to continue to go up. So at least in my opinion, the way I, I view investing and how I want to do it is I think, okay, if I had all these properties paid off, what's the monthly income that's generated from it? Yeah. And then I have a certain number that I'm looking at. I'm like, this, I'd be happy if I were at X number monthly. Yeah. And if I have that and a little bit more to cover expenses that come up with associated with the properties or X, Y, Z, and that's where I'm at. So yeah. I, I personally, I want to leverage a bit more to get to that point. And then once I'm at that point, I'm like, okay, all these properties equal the number I'm looking for. Then I just pay all those properties off as quick as I can. And then I'm, and then I'm set. Yeah. I mean, I have the, the number that's looking for whatever that number is, right? Let's say it's 10,000 a month. Yeah. Right. To me, let's just use pretty average numbers. I think 10,000 a month is everybody's, should be everybody's first goal. Yeah. Like, well, that's a bare minimum that you're going to need. Yeah. So let's say 10000 a month. And let's say I do single family homes. I actually like multifamily yeah. units. But let's just say single family homes. And let's say on average, I buy them for 350 
and they they rent for twenty five hundred. I mean, right? Yeah. Things will change and things will vary, but let's just use those numbers. Then I really need to have at least four, and let's say five, because that extra, right, for whatever that can happen or come up, I'm co I'm covered. Yeah. So it's five, right? So my goal in this scenario is to own five of these properties. Yeah. So it's how fast can I get those five? And once I have those five, then the next goal is how fast can I pay them off? And then pay them off and then you're at the point where, hey, I've now got all this passive income. And if you don't need it, then I mean, you, you have flexibility there. Whether you want to take that passive income and plug it into another property yeah. and then continue to grow whether you want to take and invest that into other businesses, whether you want to take and use that to pay for your kid's school, whether you want to take that and, I mean, you can do a number of different things with it, but the point is that you have that flexibility. Right. If you're not doing that and if you're not leveraging, then some folks are like, hey, I'm just going to buy my house and that's, that's the asset I own, yeah. which is good and it's better to do that and have your net worth build up that way than not have anything. But... If you can leverage it out a little bit more to a good place, everyone else is being conservative. It opens up a door to be a little bit more aggressive. Again, right. I don't, I don't suggest super over leveraging and, yeah. and having no equity and any little adjustment in the market will kill you. That's that's a bad way, that's a bad way to, to build up wealth yeah. in anything, regardless of real estate or anything else. But that's my perspective on what it is. I know yours is a little bit different. Um, Let's talk about your your condo yeah. perspective. So, um, well, the fastest way to get five properties is convince your spouse, man or woman, whatever you guys, or or if you just agree to buy one house every year, year and a half. Because if you will live in that house, the the loan, the loan only requires you to live there for for one year. You just sign a document saying I intend to live here for a year, and then they give you the low down payment. Um, you do it for 3%, 5%, whatever. You can, you can buy a property, a primary residence. So you can do that five times in like five or six years. If you can, if you have the ability to save up three to 5% down, you can go and live in a property for five years and then be done. Hold all five of them until you're 30, you let the renters pay them down. And so that's the fastest way to get five properties. Um, but uh, what I what I have done, because I, I, didn't, I didn't do it that way. I wish I would have, but I didn't. Well, I don't know. It's just been different. The market went up so much, it tempted me to sell, and I've, I've sold. So my personal route that I have gone, it doesn't mean it's for everybody, but I snowballed these properties we lived in, built up some equity, and then I, I every time I always, you know, I had another kid, and now I have three kids, so i got to get the bigger house, and, and my friends and everybody else is buying bigger houses. So then I, I bought my little 70 grand house that was 680 square feet, then I bought a twin home that was 1,100 square feet. Then I bought, uh, then I built a house that was 3,000 square feet. All along the way, always making some money when we sold, tax-free. And then the 3,000 square foot house, which is a big house if you're out of state, but in Utah, that's like an average house. Um, and and the basement was unfinished, whatever. But we made a good chunk of money on that. And after four years, we lived in that one for um, a little while. And so anyway, I sold that one and then I downsized. I went backwards. I'm like, oh, okay, I, uh, I'm not practicing what I'm preaching for my investing. I had only, I had, I'd snowballed those houses. So that's good. And I didn't spend the money on anything other than just constantly using it for down payment and whatever. Um, and, um, I actually bought silver with one of them, which is a different topic, but, uh, Anyway, so we sold the big house and um, I downsized. I, I downsized now to 1,040 square feet, three bed, one bath, three kids, husband, wife. And this is how they did it in the 50s. The lady that owned that house before lit, raised six kids there. Um, <laughs> you know, that's how people used to do it. Now the, price, the, the square foot per person has gone way up. You know, how much room we all need these days is like way higher. And so we're doing this. Will it be that forever? I don't know. But it allowed me to snowball all that real estate forward and nearly pay off the house that I live in. And then I muscled my way through to finish paying it off uh, recently. And now I've got no stress. I'm not going to be the guy giving somebody my keys uh, because I couldn't make money anymore and pay my payment. So I'm, I, I feel very comfortable with that. 
the amount of money sitting in that paid off house could have leveraged my retirement plan. And it could do it right now. I could go take the money out and go buy probably around, I don't even know, I haven't done the math, but probably like seven properties. And, and then I'd be done. You know, I can then let the renters pay it off for 30 years. So that's my route. It's a little Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey's all about pay your house off. He, he's as far as pay cash for rentals. I'm not that far. But uh, so that's what we did. I bought, a, I bought a condo while I owned the bigger house. I did buy a condo um, as a rental property, and I, I really enjoyed that. And then I, I downsized snowball, you know, and, and nearly I paid off my primary residence now by downsizing. As this market's gone up, it's given everybody, I'm selling homes and most everybody I'm selling these homes for, they get even between 50 and $120,000 on average, almost every time right now. And so I downsized with that equity and chiseled away at the rest. And now I am ready to go to town. Um, I could go and buy, I, I just closed on one last week, another condo. And the reason I like condos is because I did rent my single family 70 grand house out. I did rent that out for a year and uh, the grass was like at the roof, you know, and weeds were up at the roof line in it. And that makes the value of a home go down when your landscaping is a mess and the sewer line was starting to go out. And I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. Condos, no landscaping. The HOA insures the whole thing. I don't even have insurance on my one condo um, because it's insured by the HOA. So that helps my passive, my cash flow because there's no insurance. The HOA covers the water, sewer, garbage, and internet. And so it's actually paying for stuff covers the roof and the sewer line. And so, yeah, the HOA could go up over time, but so will the rents. And, um, and so I, I like condos. Another thing about condos for the advanced listener, the depreciation is better on a condo because there's no land value. You, you can only depreciate real estate on the building. And so with a house, there's a lot of land value and you can't depreciate land. You can only depreciate the house. So on my condo, I bought it for 157 and at the time, the, the land value was $16,000. So the difference between 16,000 and 157, it's like a 90% basically of the, the, the purchase price is all depreciable. Whereas a house, it's not that way. So I get a better rate on depreciation with condos. The HOA relieves me of all my worst nightmares. And, um, and it's pretty recession proof. There is a recession, people need the affordable stuff. And so that's my route. I really like these condos. I will, I, I, I've almost bought a house recently as a rental. Like there's, there's times where a house is like, oh, that's a good deal. It's tempting. I think houses overall will go up better than condos in value. But, um, but if, if we become unaffordable, it's the opposite. Condos will have a higher percentage of growth. And in and, and Utah, for the last four years, condos have, have appreciated way faster than single family homes because single family is now above what the median income can afford, so they gotta go down the chain. Townhomes are the number one appreciating real estate. You know, townhomes appreciate better than single family and then condos and then single family. But that's just because we're becoming an unaffordable market compared to what people get paid. So that's my strategy. Um, and so I'll probably, I'm still going through this, but I'll probably leverage three condos um, I'll, I'll get a loan on three condos. My personal house is paid off. I'll work on chiseling down one condo. And then when that's, con when that, you know, you get the passive income from three rentals, it's going to be roughly 900 to to $1,000 from the three. You apply all of that towards one mortgage plus the rent on that condo. You'll tackle that pretty quick. And if you have any disposable income from your day job, you can chisel away at that too. Get that condo paid off. Once you muscle the first one, that's the hardest thing. But from there, it's gonna snowball forward very easily and very quick. Once you get three paid off, according to my math, you a $200,000 condo purchase, you'll be able to pay those condos off in like three years when you start applying three paid off condos with the rents towards the fourth and then the fifth. And so it just, all the rents are tackling one mortgage at a time, bam, bam, bam. And it's gonna snowball. And then when you're older, you're not even working anymore and you're paying these condos off. And so that's what I like. It's not the best mathematical equation when you factor in, I'm not getting interest deductions. I'm not getting, de well, that's it, I guess. I'm not getting interest deductions. Um, 
and maybe my money could have gone and leveraged more where the renters are paying off more mortgages. But I've heard stories where people had 50 leveraged rentals, their income then, you know, whatever, time slowed down, maybe you had a couple vacancies and a couple repairs all at the same time. You're not liquid enough. If you don't have money in the bank to fix the repairs or make the mortgages on three or four leveraged properties, if if the stars align just right, so you had a couple vacancies unexpected and a couple repairs to get it re-rented, this one needs some carpet, it takes liquidity. And so there's two schools of thought, leverage, 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 and to solve the liquidity problem, only buy when you can put $10,000 in a separate bank account just for that property. I think that's a, a safe way to feel good about having 10 leverage properties if you're not a multi-million dollar income earner. You know, you'll be prepared because you saved up the money, you put it in an account per property to handle a vacancy or a repair per property. And then that, that would feel good about, you know, I'd feel good about leveraging in, in that regard. Uh, but for now, I'm young, I'm blessed to make decent money, and I feel that it is possible right now for me to just chisel away at one and snowball forward. But let's say I didn't have the income that I do and and I couldn't see a way to, to, to do that in the time frame that's needed, then I would make my minimum goal $10,000 in an account, or even five, but 10,000, 7,000 probably, happy medium, set it aside per property to handle your problems that if they arise. I haven't had any big real estate problems in my rentals. The worst that's happened is somebody emailed me and said, one of my tenants said, I'm out of here. I, I'm done, you can keep my deposit. So I go over there and she didn't move a thing. Her prom dress, her knives, kitchen stuff, five computers, couches and TVs, everything was there. And I emailed her back, do you want any of this? What about your prom dress? She said, oh, my prom dress. Yeah, I'm going to come back and get that. <laughs> she left everything else. So I, I took her deposit. That paid for more than enough to get a U-Haul. And I loaded the whole thing up in like two hours because it's a little place, by the way, little condos, little houses not hard to clean up. I loaded the whole thing by myself, took it to the landfill and was done. So that's the worst that I've had. Um, and so that's my strategy. I want to get a few paid off so that they do the hard work on paying other ones off for me when I need the retirement income later. Right now, I'm happy to work. I don't, I don't need to get there too fast. Good deal. No, I appreciate that insight. And, and it's good. In my opinion, it's good to see different investment strategies. We have a few other folks that, that I know and they really love single family homes. I like actually multifamily units. It's really, really what I like. Yeah. You do your duplexes, your triplexes, fourplexes. Same thing. You have a, They're not 100% recession proof, but when people need to downsize, they downsize into these. Yeah, totally. When you have young couples who are in a good economy, you have young couples who need housing then they go in there they take really good care of the place and they stay rented yeah i mean I, that's why i like multifamily units and on top of that is they appreciate very well um so with all that being said there's one more little thing that we haven't talked about which is why again and i think the having a reserve account for emergencies is is an absolute must i do love leverage i love playing that game i love the way the numbers play out on it but I wouldn't leverage if I didn't have money saved up. Yeah, to handle the worst case. I mean, yes, that, that's an absolute must. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, but the one thing I do want to mention, and this is, again, goes back to my strategy of I want to have as much as I can in the next five years, is I honestly think that we are going to see a raise in minimum wage, right? There's a lot of speculation on there. Um, there's a lot of talks about $15 an hour is where a lot of cities have moved to. I mean, you've got New York City doing $15 an hour. Um, I know Seattle is doing that as well. Mm. And you have a couple other places where it's sparking up. And I think nationwide, right, this is speculation. We haven't seen minimum wage has been, it's been in the low $7 an hour for a long time now. So I think we are going to see a big shift there. And every the cost of living has continued to go up. And then the wages have not kept up with that. But even that being said, at Panda Express, I see this, I think they pay like $12 an hour to their employees out there. So I think we are gonna see minimum wage go up to that certain point, right? And if say does it go up to 15%, $15 an hour, 
and then right now it's at 745, 765, something like that. That's almost double, if not more. And if it goes up double, what does that mean? Contrary to, I don't want to get too political here, but what a lot of folks believe is that just means the rest of the, the cost of living is going to go up as well. Yeah. I mean, raising minimum wage isn't a huge fix, but I do think that's a shift that we are going to see. And what does that mean? Is rents are going to go up, rents are going to go up, house values are going to go up, all that's going to go up. And I think we're at, personally, although people are like, oh, I think we're at the top of the wave, I still think we're at the bottom of the wave and we're going to see a lot a lot more of this go on. Maybe we'll see a couple of dips or something like that in between. But I think within the next five years, we are going to see that. And I think potentially in the next five years, we will see that top of the wave or top of a wave because we are going to continue to see a growth in population. But that's that's kind of how I see it playing out, which is my goal is, hey, that's that income number I'm looking for, the amount of property that I need to be there, yeah. get to that ASAP, and then let it go. I mean, right? I mean, let it go. I mean, not let it go. Let, let the properties go. Let them take care of themselves. And then again, with the excess income that I have, then I use that. Again, I what my strategy boils down to is, is, is probably four steps. One, increase your income as much as you can, right? Whether that's going out and working a couple extra hours, whether that's doing a little side business that you have going on there. I mean, bottom line is get your income higher. Yeah. And the next step is get your expenses lower. I mean, as low as low as you can go. Yeah. There's no reason to to keep up with the Joneses. There's no reason to have these weird appearances or X Y Z. Like keep your expenses just. This is my strategy again. I'm yeah, not saying totally. That is a good one. But keep your expenses as low as you can, right? And then with whatever excess you have there, because you've increased your income and you lowered your expenses. Then you take that and you invest it. Yeah. And then once you're investing it, then you use that investment when the excess associated with it, either to help you buy other properties or to pay that off quicker. And then you go in and that's how you build a very solid, very safe and a leveraged net worth. And again, everyone plays a different game. If you're 50, maybe you don't want to play net worth game. What you want to look for is properties that are going to give you a good cash flow and help yes. facilitate that process. Everyone's different on where you're looking for, but that's that's my philosophy. I think it's going to work out well, but it's what is it that you need? How is it that you can accomplish that? And what tools and what strategies do you need to get there? And I think that's what bottom line is. And hopefully the data that we've given helps to formulate an opinion for yourself so you can go out and do that. I know this has been a little longer episode. I. I get carried away and I love hearing Devin's thoughts and Devin's opinions um, on what you're sharing there. It's, it's, it's great. And I think we're, we're aligned in a lot of things, maybe a little different in some, but hopefully that's valuable to you guys who are listening to it. So again, I appreciate you Devin for coming in and taking your time to, to share your thoughts here and give, go over your insight. Yeah, you're very welcome. Great. We've been, I'll, I'll tell you guys the truth. I'll let you in on the secret. We, one of our cameras ran out of battery, so we're switching, we're switching <laughs> some back and forth right now, but hopefully through the editing, it won't be too bad, but I really do. I appreciate Devin coming in. I hope it's been a valuable experience for you guys. Um, I know it has for me. And again, whatever you guys need, I'm happy to go in. I know Devin's also happy to answer questions. So feel free to leave the comments in there um or send a private message and we're happy to go over those details thanks again